This is Kim Meyer, host of Choose to Rise. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Hello. Hey, man. What's going on? Hey, Jay. What's up, man? You ready to talk movies? I'm ready to talk movies. Let's do it. Hello and uh, welcome to another episode of Fear and There, uh, your local horror movie podcast between two friends who don't live near each other and would like to record their friendship on tape. I am Jay and I'm calling in from New York City. And this is Zachary and I'm calling in from Beacon, New York. Uh, You know, the wild west of Beacon. It's west of the city, right? Uh, It's more north than anything. But it's also west, so, you know, give this to me. I, I guess you could have it, but it's not. It's not like personality-wise, doesn't feel western. <clears throat> you think you know? it's like, yeah. You think I, it's more like north northwest versus north west west or whatever, <laughs> like or west northwest. I would. I would actually say, looking at the map, that it is due north of the city and not even slightly west of the city. Okay, I'm well, sorry, you scumbag. This is a great way to yeah, start. I'm, I'm sorry to t- <laughs> tell you. Yeah. Uh, well, this episode is uh, episode 18, I believe, or 17. Oh, my God. That's a, that's a I think it's 18, which would which would I mean, that would mean that's a pretty significant. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's, it's milestone. It's, yeah. Our, our this episode can now vote. It can now be drafted. Um, <laughs> Not a whole lot else. <laughs> it's basically I can buy it can buy a pack of I cigarettes. Guess, I guess can consent in most states. <laughs> like <laughs> all right we're gonna move on from this um th- uh, this episode actually is uh interesting for a couple of ways uh first of all it being 18 so it can vote as we just mentioned but also it is uh our first uh, it is our oldest movie to date i would say um this uh the film that That's we are dis- discussing on this episode is Eyes Without a Face uh from 1960. The director is Georges Franjou or as Zach oh, re- nice. as Zach really wanted me to say is uh Georges Franjou. Um we don't know it could be more than one George and I just wanted to cover our bases. It's, it, we, it's maybe true. we do know that though, don't. Um yeah, so this is a uh, a French language film, if you couldn't guess by the director's name. Uh and the original title is oh, mm, le, yeah, le, exactly. les, les yeux sans visage or whatever. Uh yeah, so this is an exciting one because it's um like I said it marks our oldest film. It came out in 1960 in France, uh I believe 1962 it was its US debut. Um and I think- in in like a in a very heavily altered uh and from what I understand much less effective version also yeah i mean which doesn't surprise me and and i'm going to get into some of the i think we should Mm -hmm. definitely get into some of the um grotesqueries involved in this film because um i was very taken aback uh and i thought they were also kind of kind of like done effectively even though they were in you know in places gratuitous um but yeah i mean this this film this film's a trip, man. And uh, mm. I think it also marks our first Criterion Collection film, which is great. Um, oh, is that true? Oh, mm-hmm. funny. Okay. I, I believe so. I mean, is Texas Chainsaw on the Criterion Collection? I find it hard to believe that it would be, but... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it ought to be. Maybe one day. Yeah, I mean, well, it's coincidentally, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is also the second oldest one that we've done. So um, <laughs> this uh, this film was... It's a great, great film. Um, it, I don't really feel like I need to do a whole lot more discussion about what it is. It is one of those classics that people talk about that, you know, it, it, I would say it's kind of on, on the, uh, the second, um, the second rung that you approach as a fan of horror. Um, you, you tend to go after your Rosemary's babies and your exorcists and, uh, <laughs> and your psychos before you, you go to something like this. But, um, this is definitely a certifiable classic, um, mm-hmm. I would say. And uh, a lot of influence came from this that I didn't, don't think I realized. So, um, yeah, I was, I was really excited to watch it. Um, and as we do with this, um, I just doled out my context to you, Zach. But uh, what, what did you know mm. about this film before you, uh, before you watched it? Oh, um, 
I mean, I knew, I knew I would say very little concrete about this movie, but I, I still, but it occupied, it, it is for many years at this point, loomed pretty large in the like ever growing and always intimidating list of films that I want to see slash need to see, you know, as a, uh, as an amateur horror, horror, horologist. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm never going to say that again. Um, it, so, I, I mean, this movie, this film has one of those totally indelible, tremendously creative posters. So I, I know, I mean, and, and the poster, of course, is really just an image, or at least the poster that I know it, uh, you know, from the Criterion Collection and from, and like the main poster that seems to be the image for it on Letterboxd, say, or something like that. It's really just a, an image, it's a still from the film of, of our protagonist, or, or at least one of the main characters, and, and the mask that she wears, but we'll get into that. Uh, or, so the image... Is it actually yeah. the mask? It, it, it feels like the image... Well, we can talk a bit about it, but it feels like it's not the mask, but rather that that section of the photo has been cut out. Interesting. That's cool. Okay, I'll have to, I'll have to look at it a little bit more carefully. Um... So, so the poster has always been in my mind, and the poster is such a good, it's such an effective poster. Yeah. It makes me want, it made me want to see the movie forever, and I, and I just for whatever reason had never gotten around to it. So I, I knew about it roughly, and I knew that it that it had a, uh, that it holds a pretty uh, significant place in like the horror canon. Um, but as far as like its reaction, I mean, its reception when it came out and the influence of it, you know, I didn't, I didn't know any of the particulars. I, I didn't even know the basic plot of it. So mm-hmm. this really felt um, like there were all these fantastic surprises in this for me. Uh, like Edith Scoob, I don't know how to say her last name. Scoob, Scoob I want to say like the nickname for Scooby Doo, but Edith Scoob, Scoob. Like I just saw her. I just saw her. <laughs> uh, Mandy and I watched uh, Things to Come, this terrific French debut with Isabelle Huppert. And she plays Isabelle Huppert's character's mother right mm-hmm. before she passed away, which was just in the last couple of years. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm seeing this tremendous actress 60 years younger and all of these great little uh, resonances. And I knew that I knew the work of the composer. I didn't know who what his name was, but like I looked him up. I said, oh, my God, this is the guy who did Lawrence of uh, Arabia as a guy who did uh, Dr. Yeah, Zhivago. Of course. Yeah. Uh, Maurice Jarre. So we'll get into that stuff. But yeah, this so, is that's this, my, my context. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of French film royalty here i mean mm-hmm. um i mean the uh the supporting actress alida valli who is a right i believe in it an, an italian actress who was in suspiria which uh the, and the third man mm-hmm. one of yep. one of my favorite films of all time which is incredible yeah yeah i mean this is uh you, you don't know if you don't know exactly who the people are you kind of know them and mm-hmm. uh and I think that that works to incredible effect in this film. Uh, the acting in this movie is just like out of control. Good. Um, yeah. So great. Yeah. How did you watch it? On a uh, criterion collection uh, on my TV at night lights off actually prime prime viewing experience, really sort of the ideal uh, viewing experience. Mm-hmm. The, uh, me. the criterion yeah. app or something. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. I didn't realize. Do you do you subscribe to that or pay for that? Or I am a subscriber. I am a subscriber. Well, I didn't know that. Maybe we should uh, maybe do a couple more, a um, couple more Criterion oh, films. I'm sure. That's your, I, talk my language. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there are a few other horror movies on there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. A lot. I'm sure. I mean, is Psycho on there? Got to be right. Um, uh, I'm not sure. Hitchcock right now is a hot commodity. I think like fucking Peacock took all the Hitchcocks. I, I'm not. Oh, really? I don't know. I, it's such a it's such a sad maze of streaming services, and the 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 people and the only losers are the people who like movies. <laughs> it's just such a shame. I mean, it's true. It it does make it easier to find a film without paying for it. I would say, like, what I would normally have done was like, I mean, back when we were young whippersnappers. Um, oh yeah, snapping we, whips. Yeah, we would, uh, you know, we'd go down to the blockbuster and find the movie, um, mm-hmm. or you'd have to buy it, but. I think like now it's like a quick Google search will at least tell you if you already have access to it, which is right, um, right. which is nice. You know, there it's a double edged sword yeah. though, for sure because yeah. because like it's sort of a land grab kind of. Like, I mean, it's like it's kind of what happened. I mean, not to go to, too far down this rabbit hole, but it's kind of what happened um, when you know networks, TV networks, um, 
you know, were first gaining traction and then cable right. cable happened. And then, you know, the, the network saw all the success of cable and we're like, let's buy up all these networks. And then suddenly you had to like choose right. packages and, you know, yeah, uh, exactly. And so here we are again, kind of like we're making de facto packages by, you know, I, each of us owns at least six streaming service, uh, subscriptions, even if we steal them from friends, you know, um, and and the and the real tragedy of it to me is is as usual it's just it's just it's greed it's sort of capitalist greed that's like like we could have i mean all of these companies could theoretically say this is a subscription this is you pay a subscri- a monthly subscription you have access to our entire library of of films that we have license to at any given moment you just have you can see all of them but instead they artificially withhold certain films so that mm-hmm. they can make it like, did you ever see that Futurama episode that was about slurm? And it was like, like, well, you know, we'll take away the, we'll take away the best slurm for a while and then bring it back and reintroduce it oh, as slurm yeah, yeah, classic. Right, 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 right. Yeah. It's like, I mean, that's what these streaming services are doing in a, in a nutshell. It's just, well, they, it's they, playing we, off. I mean, the nostalgia thing is powerful. I mean, this isn't just streaming service. Disney, like the concept of the Disney vault is so silly. sure. Um, it's so silly. Yeah. Just, it, just let, let people see everything at once. It's art- charge, it's, charge more if you want, but don't play the silly game of hype mm-hmm. and, and artificial. It's artificial you know, supply and demand is what it is. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I hear you. And I can totally see why you specifically would hate this. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's either that's both that's simultaneously a compliment and an insult, and I appreciate that. Yeah, that, isn't that our friendship simultaneously a compliment? <laughs> and it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I also watched this film. You know, lights off, couch evening, um, very bright nice. film. Something that I'd like to talk mm. about later, mm. because the con. I mean, it's not a bright film in concept because it a lot of this <laughs> no. movie takes place at night um but it's it's like a technological thing that we haven't brushed up against because you know the contrast of, of black and white film production you know yes you need to uh, to keep things visible so um and it's interesting how just shockingly bright this movie is on the eyeballs um it's not a shadowy movie that's right no and so uh yeah, so I don't know that, that watching it at night, oh, it was very, very jarring how bright it was because all the lights were off and it was right. at night. Um, but I don't know. It probably would have been just as effective during the day. Um, mm, true. Yeah, and, you know, my context was just, just what you said. Criterion Collection film, famous actors, famous crew, um, a movie that I was excited to check off the list and I'm now even more excited to discuss it. So Yeah, let's do it. I think in record time... We are going to put up the spoiler wall, so if ye haven't seen it, ye shall not pass. <laughs> uh, the spoiler wall is going up right now. <laughs> hey, Zach. Here we are again in spoiler land. Hi, Jay. Nice oh, to see you. Yeah, really nice to see you. I, uh, I, know, I mean, I don't see you. I hear you, but I'm envisioning you. Um, mm, you could see me. And you probably see me in my best self, I feel like. <laughs> my idealized self. Yeah, yeah. Um... Okay, so Eyes Without a Face. I've got a lot of things that I want to talk about that I think would be good to to brush into it that really don't have a whole lot to do with what actually happens in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take us through the discussion section, um, which is the meat of the podcast, as they say. Uh, but feel free to interject. Um, if I start, if I start dragging us along, I'm, I'm going to try to get us through this so that our poor listeners who are probably don't have much of a commute anymore, um, <laughs> don't, uh, you know, don't have to sink more than, uh, more than 50 minutes or something into this. So, um, or, you know, you let, you let us know about length if you want. Email us at fear in there at gmail.com and tell us. <laughs> if our, if, well, it's interesting. Do you, I, like a podcast, you don't turn to a podcast like ours to get information. Like, this is not a data driven podcast. No, you you probably don't learn a whole lot of new stuff, right? I mean, this is a podcast. I think that you that if you listen to our podcast, it's because you enjoy, uh, I don't know, the rhythms of our conversation, and also you like horror movies. And so, yeah. I, I think that we need to. So, with all that said, I mean, I think minimum of three hours is what we should be expecting and demanding <laughs> our sure. our For listeners sure. to spend with us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think a lot of uh, podcasts about movies. You got to toe a nice line because I think people listen to a podcast about a movie so that they can relive that movie. Um, and they can think about that movie again, you know? 
Sure, sure, um, sure, sure. And so, yes, that is a good point. I will, I will try to give us, I will try to give our listener enough scint- scintillating uh, commentary. <laughs> um, all right. So just be funny, Jay. Be funnier. You're you're fine, but be even funnier. Yeah. Keep being funny. <laughs> um, okay, so now that we're on the safety of this, of the other side of the the spoiler wall, um, I wanted to admit something to you. Um, oh God, I am. I find old movies almost wholesale to be corny, and mm. and let me let me explain because I think there's going to be some people taken aback, and I know we've talked about the idea of age and you know classicality of a movie is not mm-hmm. is not a sign of quality. I don't think it should be a sign of quality. And I think a lot of people would disagree to that effect. Right. Um, so I'm going to get past that for a second. I just simply, okay. when I watch a, an old movie and I see, so, so it's not even just horror movies cause horror movies is kind of a different thing, but any old movie, right. There were adult content movies before the rating system like this is a Mm -hmm. a non-rated movie and all movies were unrated even you know like i don't think citizen citizen kane didn't have a rating right because the rating system didn't exist back then the mpaa did not exist yeah so the idea of adult content and what would be considered r-rated content in those movies is always shocking to me so when, (laughs) when we're going through an old movie and and i and they cut to a new scene and there's boobs I'm always like, uh-huh. wait, I'm like, wait, this isn't an episode of the Andy Griffith show. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's like, I feel like that always handicaps a movie for me because, you know, the way it was shot, the way that the performances were done, you know, most movies were, were sort of, you know, they were transitioning from like uh, radio plays and, you know, actual stage acting plays to putting things on camera, on TV and on film. And so there was a manner of, of, of composition and a manner of acting um, that just feels a little trite to me at times. Um, well, so let me, I just, I'm curious just so I understand this better. What, like what constitutes an old movie to you? Because by 1960, they were well past, you know, agreed. coming out of the primordial stew of, of radio plays and, and stage plays, you know, sure. the 1960 is already very, I mean, I would say by the, by the end of the thirties and already by the mid forties, you're, you have a pretty, like it stands by itself. Film stands as its own thing no, by that, itself. That's true. That's fair. Uh, I, I would say this this is sort of toward the end of what I would consider an old movie. You know, okay. like okay. this definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. feels like an old film to me. Um, and it, it, truth be told, this movie is twice as old as I am. So, <laughs> you know, I don't, I know, I don't, think, it's, crazy? I don't think, yeah. think it's unreasonable to think of it that way. No, uh, not I mean, at all. Not at all. Right. Not at all. I mean, this movie came out 60 years ago. So right. um, what I guess my point I'm driving at here is so. So, so for example, um, Julie's father really likes films of the, of the fifties and, and, <laughs> and early sixties. He just, you know, he just mm-hmm. likes them. Um, he's kind of an old fashioned guy and he likes the idea of art that had to overcome the technological issues of its time. Um, sure. Which is, you know, that's, so he sort of watches those films with a different nuance than I would watch a movie. Um, uh huh. Right. Which is kind of ends up being my problem with with older horror films because they just didn't have the special effects and they didn't have like the track record of, of 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 you know they didn't see they didn't have all the mistakes that <laughs> that people make in mm-hmm. movies. So it's like I think right. newer films have the benefit of seeing what worked and what didn't work and what can be done now. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, um, but he watches it from you know I, it's not even nostalgia. It's like sort of like reverence you know um yeah that sure. he watches those films but then again it'll be a, a movie that then you'll turn a corner and there'll just be like a topless lady and you're like you're like oh right right these are not all like you know they're not all like primetime dramas on on nbc or whatever um so do do you are you like do you think that because something is because a film is you know past a certain age kind of that there's like a like that the sensors sort of are are more at play that you're going to you, that you're, you've come to expect a kind of art that's much more like a, a prude in a sense I, I like, like that, or, or wholesome that's, maybe wholesome i mean maybe? that's yeah. part of it in the 50s when elvis shook his hips like that was a whole fucking thing um yeah 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 uh 
but I mean, that's me regurgitating what the history books told me, you know, like there were always more prude people and less prude people. Um, no, I, I think that's part of it, but, but I'm sort of arriving at the point being the aesthetic put forth by these films, by, by films, call it between the forties and the early sixties, say, I don't know. I'm just putting timestamps so that we can talk about it. Um, sure. Those films seem hokier, more romanticized, more dramatic, mm-hmm. more more focused on the monologue, more focused on like those kinds of things. Um, right. And therefore, when something like boobs or gratuitous violence comes up, it feels out of place because of some misguided assumption I have about the aesthetic hmm. of the film. That's interesting. And yeah. So I'm going to r- arrive very sluggishly at the point here. Um, <laughs> this film... I found this film to be terrifying um, yeah. and very, very scary at some very key moments. And the yeah. fact that this film was able to get past my sort of sure, n- naivete sure. about to, to take a, to take a f- co-opted French word. Um, oh, wow. That's really yeah. sophisticated of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, you know. Um, I also eat French fries from... From, from <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> it's so obnoxious. <laughs> um, but this movie was terrifying. And so I wanted to ask yeah. you, did you go into this? Because I went into this with, a, a, you know, I want to say subconscious, but I was I was ready to not be scared. You know, when I went, I was ready to be like, okay, cool. There's no way they're, they're going to push the envelope enough for me in this movie to be scary, to, mm, be, mm-hmm. to be conceptually scary, because I'm so used to like something way more over the top. Um, yes. And so that was my expectation. And the fact that that movie blew past that for me, uh, Mm -hmm. I I have tremendous respect for the film and, um, sure. It's, I mean, it's kind of weird to say I have tremendous respect for this movie being discussed (laughs) for like a Um, horror classic from 1960. Yeah. Yeah. Um, No one needs your respect, Jay. Yeah. yeah. Right. (laughs) We're, we're important film critics. Remember we each (laughs) each are are one half of Roger Ebert. I don't know. Are you in, are you in Charlie Kaufman's new novel? I I, I don't think uh, unless you're, unless you're, unless you're one of the film critics listed in that book, then I don't know if we've made it or not. Well, don't bring up Charlie Kaufman. We we left. Right, I'm so sorry. We left that film <laughs> oh, on the wayside, and listeners, I you know. are not you are not going to hear us talk about. I'm thinking of ending things. Um, In fact, you could have been right now, but you're not. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wanted to ask you: mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you go into this film assuming it would not be as intense as something newer? Um, sure, sure. And was you know? Did you go into it that way? And then you know, were you blown away like I was? Okay. So first of all, I really appreciate, uh, your, the preamble. I really appreciate your context and, and, and the point that you make about watching old cinema, um, which is an important point. Um, we are millennials as gross as it is to say that out loud. And, and people expect in my experience, baby boomers and, and the elderly, the silent generation, whatever they are, uh, the silent, the, the greatest generation, right? Yeah. I, I, there's a silent one too. I'm not sure. And, mm-hmm. and um, pe- people expect that we have no appreciation for context and simultaneously no ability to learn things about the time that preceded us. Like I, I, in my life, I am routinely. It feels like I'm routinely astounding people when I have heard of Alfred Hitchcock. They're like, "How do you know who Alfred Hitchcock is?" And I, I and I and it's and it's a really sort of baffling thing to say to a 31 year old. Uh, who also grew up with the internet, so yeah, uh, and right. who loves movies or, or whatever stand in you want, you know? It's like, oh, you know who Picasso is? That's crazy. You weren't alive when he was when he made Guernica, so and so on. Um, so, I my experience with older art is, I guess, maybe the story of a kind of evolution in a way. I don't know. Um, I definitely know what you're saying when it comes to like a perceived corniness or, or a contrivedness or, or also just like a sense that this thing that was supposed to be so scandalizing. I mean, I read something in, 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 after I watched the film last night, I did a bunch of reading about this film. And when it played, I think at a film festival for the first time, or maybe it was a test screening, I think somewhere in the UK, like people, people passed out. <laughs> and it's like, it's mm-hmm. such a quaint and peculiar 
thing to think about now because I, 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 the only movie that I can think of that made me really nauseated when I saw it in theaters was Eraserhead, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. But like otherwise, otherwise I can count on not passing out when I watch a movie. So I don't know. What I would say is when I first really seriously got into art, and I, and I mean like, like art across medium, so like – and for me, that's mostly novels and, and mostly film – I I definitely had that reaction when it came to reading older novels, thinking that the language was really arch and that uh, the prose was like stilted and weird and kind of embarrassing and also kind of hard to follow and sort of distant. And with film, I thought it was corny. I thought it was maybe too wholesome in a way. Uh, I didn't get, I didn't understand it. But the more that I watched and the more that I read, the more I got inured to um, the kind of restrictions that you see uh, like the technology restrictions, the res- are, uh, um, the the uh, uh, I don't know old traditions of acting, whatever it is. And so now, when I watch an old movie, I just watch an old movie. I, it doesn't it doesn't feel particularly um, corny to me mm-hmm. by virtue of the fact that it's old. I don't know. I feel like I'm 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 off the point a little bit, but basically, I. So I expected that I would not be scared of this movie precisely for the reasons that you just nicely outlined. Like I suspected that it would not be <clears throat> uh, all that effective. It would not affect me emotionally uh, no. because there's definitely a remove, like a remove through time. But I don't know. I, 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 I still felt like I was watching a pretty contemporary film with this one. Yeah. I And I don't know you know the first scene is very very dated um because you know it's a gr- mm-hmm. you know it's a it's a green screen <laughs> car that like right, she's right, driving right. in a car that's wobbling and clearly not a real car driving um but then she pulls a body out of the car and throws a body into the water and you don't <laughs> see the face of the body you see that it's kind of a mangled face and you aren't even sure if it's a mm-hmm. woman or a man until she takes it out and mm-hmm. you know and and you see the women woman's leg um so yeah, it, the movie immediately is like where we mean business here. This is not going to be a, this is not a good movie for people who don't like murder and death. Um, so right. yeah, I think that is a huge part of it. Um, well, yeah, I think this, this fits nicely into sort of the second point I wanted to cover here, which is movies that are gross for the sake of being gross. Um, and that is, so this movie, um, this movie kind of fits into that mold for me a little bit. And I don't mean, I'm going to try to figure out the best way to say this. Um, let me, let me back up. So if I had to list five of the most disturbing movies of all time, Mm. you know, as the sentence, uh, and I think different people are scared of different things. And, um, it's hard to do that. You know, like a lot of people quote unquote passed out at the exorcist, right? Like, like this is, this is, <laughs> that's, that's something people love to say at film festivals. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, people walked mm-hmm. out. They just threw their hands up and were like, nonsense. <laughs> they threw rotten tomatoes. Yep. At the, so, um, but what I mean by disturbing is I think we all know what I mean. Like something 10, 10 steps past torture porn, like something, that somebody is mm. like, let me put the most disgusting, depraved things on the camera as I could possibly imagine. And the movies that mm-hmm. come to mind when you talk about that is 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 um that solo movie. Um, oh God, yep. The uh, the something of the Sodom movie. Uh, yeah, yeah, 120 days of, of Sodom, Sallow. Yep. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. I've, I've unfortunately seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you think of movies like, uh, I mean, Cannibal Holocaust, we've talked about before. Um, mm-hmm. There's this movie called like Necromancia, which I don't need to describe at all what that's about. Um, so the I, I, I don't think that these are great movies. I think maybe eventually it might be good for us to like do a quick episode on one of these to talk about this concept a little more in depth. Um, sure. Yeah. Because it's a fascinating thing um, because none of these movies are good. You know, none of these movies I would consider <laughs> quality films because you throw out all of your you, you throw out all of your ability to to make commentary on something when you go so far. Um, and I'm going to revisit the other one that I would put on the list in a second. Uh, the human, mm-hmm. the human centipede. Um, 
And we're going to, we are going to talk about that because I think this movie, you know, is, is kind of a precursor to that in some ways. Um, interesting. Okay. That's interesting. I've never seen human centipede, I should say. So, yeah, I, so I don't, yeah. So that, that's kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, but this movie has a scene, one specific scene that seems to serve this purpose. Um, they didn't, okay. they didn't want to go with jump scares. They didn't want to go with, um, ghosts or supernatural in this film. Uh, there are creepy moments with the lady in the mask, which I'd love to talk about those scenes. Oh, I think please. She, yep. she treats those scenes incredibly well. Um, but there's one scene in this movie that I think really like, I, I was like, Oh, sh- Oh no. Oh no. Like I was like, f- yeah. f- you know, verbally. there can only be one scene. Yes. Like, this can only be one scene. So yes. um, yeah, it's the face cutting off scene. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought, first of all, the special, the special effects were incredible for this scene. For this, so good. For 1960, I was just super impressed. and So good. And I was just in awe and also terribly sick to my stomach. Um, oh, it was awful. I know. And it, it, oh, my God. And it's so um, – the, the, the makeup is so basic, and it was still so effective. I completely agree. Yeah. And I think even though I knew, you know, 90% through the face cutting that – you know, you could see that it was not real. It was just like rubber laid over of course. over someone's face. Like you could see, but I still was like, "Oh, this is aw- this is awful. This is awful." Like, so um, yeah. And so that one that, of that, I just want to no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that one of my very first notes in this movie, uh, and it had to do <clears throat> with I think it was the police were describing a. Uh, the, their the corpse that they found in the water and describing how the face had been removed. And the writing, which is actually quite plain in this film, other than there's a lot of scientific jar- jargon, which horror movies have always loved so much. But but the writing, the dialogue is quite sparse and it's quite simple. And yet the simple way that the, that the face was described, the smooth edges actually started to kind of turn my stomach. Just listening to cops, the cops, the police who are hilariously hapless and are just utter failures, which I loved so much, um, which almost felt political to me, and I loved that. Like, just the way that they talked about um, what the face looked like. You don't see it, but talking about it, that was so effective to me. It was like, oh, my God, horror movies need to be relying on on, on the uh, viewer's imagination far more these days. Yeah, well, I mean, that that first you know, discussion of that, uh, that body recovered with the clean, the clean edges of the cut, almost as if they exactly. were done, done with scalpel. Um, exactly. They didn't show that at all. Like, no, but it worked. Once it was just film, yeah. good. And then when they pay that off and you think they're just going to go do a close up on the doctor's face and then cut back to some cuts and then back to the doctor's mm-hmm. face. And they don't nope. do that. They do what I, what I would say, like a modern film might do, or one of these like kind of like crash, disgusting movies that i was talking about would do but this movie mm-hmm, does it mm-hmm. and it isolates it to a scene they don't really feel the need to have to do anything like that again um i mean there are some some more moments but we'll talk about those um i mean this film this film is a slow burn like yeah, this this, for sure. this this is a this is a major i would imagine a major predecessor to the horror subgenre of slow burn i the first time right before we see uh christian the daughter the, the professor arrives home and it is like a good five minutes of screen time from when he parks his car in the garage mm-hmm. to when he finally enters his bedroom, her bedroom. And every step of the way is filmed and, and the professor is like methodical, almost maddening, plodding yeah. walk through the house. And that's like five minutes of ni- of a 90 minute film is dedicated to just watching a man walk through a house. And I thought it was awesome. I thought it was so good because yeah. it was freaky. It was just freaky, and that was that was terrific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it builds up incredible suspense, and and they don't show you. You know, you know that this woman. You get an idea that this woman is going to have a mangled face of some sort, um, right? Whether right. it's you know whether it's the the poster that you you referenced or the uh, you know you know the police talking about it at the beginning, you know something's fucked up with this woman's face, and then they don't show mm-hmm. it for an entire scene and the first time you see this woman's face uh is with a mask on and the mask is truly truly creepy um so i think this is a good place to to take a quick detour to um 
to to that because I'd like to talk about before I arrive at my human centipede point later. Uh, yeah, I'd like to talk about the 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 design and the makeup and the costumes in this because excellent, incredible. And I was just I kind of want to open end. What did, you, what did you think of what did you think of those? Were they effectful? Oh my god, Effe- effectful, uh, I, I, effectful, I, full of effect, effective. effectful, <laughs> oh, effectful. Oh my god. What I mean, what can I, what can I possibly say about about it? I, Edith Scope, first of all, her performance as as Christiane, our disfigured sort of main character in a way, is so haunting, so poetic, graceful, ethereal, removed, distance, cold. Like, it's so everything at once. And the mask is the perfect prop. It is just simply put the perfect movie prop. It is, it is mm-hmm. breathtaking. Um, and I... It reminded me so much of one of my all-time favorite movies um, by a, a German director named Christian Petzold. It's called Phoenix, and it's about a, uh, a Holocaust survivor. It's about, it's, about, it's about a woman who survives the Holocaust, comes home to Berlin, and her face, her face had been so disfigured that they kind of recreate it. And so her, her, her husband, who doesn't know that she survived, doesn't recognize her. And I was thinking about that movie so much for, throughout, the, throughout watching Eyes without a face and thinking like, Oh my God, this is where the whole idea came from. You know, this is, this is it. And anyway, I thought the mask was brilliant. It was breathtaking. It, it was like, Oh, it was like, you know, you know, the, the classic image of the Greek tragedy and comedy masks, you know, the really cartoonish frown and the really cartoonish mm-hmm. grin. Like this was like, what happened when you smack them together, when you like smush them together and oh, you yeah. get this weird, lifeless, dead, neutral but also still kind of plaintive like Matt I don't know the mask was brilliant I thought it was absolutely terrific I loved it I loved it I loved it um and her but but of course like like you know a movie is still only as good as its performances in some ways and and she just nails it she is such a specter um so yeah I mean that was my feeling yeah. I, I I thought the makeup like you said I mean the the, the surgery scene was spectacular in that you just were not, I just was not expecting to see it. And yet here we are seeing it, totally seeing it. Um, mm, yeah. yeah. I, I, I yeah, mean, yeah. the, the, the retractors when, when that part comes in, I like, I couldn't, I, I was like, the scalpel was enough. Um, scalpel was then, enough. Yep. Yeah. But then, then when he was like, give me the, give me, the, give me the, like the retractors. And then he starts digging under the skin with them. And you're just like, mm. oh god, like, horrible! It, it's it's vomit worthy, um, and I think it's incredible that this is a movie, you know, from from a t- from a time that I would have previously told you, like, oh yeah, even, you know, like practical effects, you know, are never going to be as good because I'm a whippersnapper. I'm a, you know, a young young movie viewer. Um, yeah, I th- I thought Scope's performance was incredible too. But it's not just her performance; like her eyes. I I feel like she was cast mm-hmm. for her eyes. Um, yeah, it's like it, she's like an anime character. Like there was just <laughs> something about the eyes in this movie, both when she had the mask on and when she had the new face on, that were just mm-hmm. simply terrifying. And calling her yeah. a specter is perfect. That was the perfect word because yeah. the way she's walking, the like sort of wistful, um, right. kind of she's almost floating through this movie and you kind of are, you keep hearing that she is kind of like a, like she's the victim in this. Um, even though she keeps right. accepting these poor women's faces, uh, like <laughs> right. she, she's the victim in this film. And so she kind of walks around like a, like a ghost who hasn't, you know, reached their, mm-hmm. their full potential and, ha- you know, hasn't passed She's on. not allowed to, to live. I mean, she's not allowed to use the phone. She can't, mm-hmm. she can't go outside. She's not allowed to do anything. Yeah. And th- her, those scenes were the, the sort of, sort of, uh, cerebrally scary scenes for me. Like anytime she mm-hmm. was walking around the house, I was like, dude, <laughs> like, yeah, this woman yeah. is very very (laughs) scary um and also just just tragic you know um you know this this movie is using a a mad scientist trope which even by 1960 was a well-worn was well-worn territory mm -hmm. i mean frankenstein it predates this by a long time and but but instead of it being instead of the professor being this like gruesome over-the-top sensationalized madman he's he's all he's actually 
a father who deeply loves his daughter. And so the brutality that comes out of him, at least in this reading, my reading of it, uh, is like you have, a, you have a guy who just wants to give his daughter a new life. Mm-hmm. And, and so, right, I mean, she is the victim, but she goes along with it because, I mean, God, uh, you know, if, you're, if your dad, who you loved very much, was, was telling you that this was the right thing to do and this was good for you, you'd, you probably would believe him, at least at first, you know? I mean, obviously, at the end, she, she's, she's liberated. Yeah. Uh, or she liberates herself. I don't want to take away her agency. She liberates herself. But well, um, she, I mean, we don't even really know what happens to anyone but the doctor and his assistant. Like everybody else, kind of just gets out, you know, and sure, goes on sure. with their lives. Which I, I found to be an interesting choice, which we can maybe circle back to at the end. Um, it's interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. that you talk about the loving father being his role because I found mm-hmm. it at odds with the other aspect of his character because it was almost confusing. It was almost like they didn't pick one. If he was a loving mm-hmm. father, right? If he was like. If it, if it was an act of love and an act of guilt, even, you know, because he uh-huh. was the reason that her face right. was disfigured, right. it would have been messier, right? It would have been more desperate, I guess. And we see him this entire movie being a sort of like moodless, calculating doctor, uh. scientist, Um which is the last point that I wanted to bring up, and that connects very nicely to the human centipede point. Um, <laughs> which in, is, in the same way that the characters of the human centipede are connected very nicely to each yeah, other, I of think. course, yeah. Well, not very nicely <laughs> at all. Maybe very, maybe very completely. Um, so, yes. So the, the concept of the human centipede, which you just need to know the concept of the movie to know how bad it is, um, to know. No, how I know. I'm, yeah, right. Is. So you understand that, but it comes from a place of a doctor being a meticulous, clean surgeon who is doing this human centipede experiment for the sake of science. Right. Um, which this movie. So, so you brought up the mad, do- the mad doctor, mad scientist, appro- uh, trope before, which, you know, Franken- mm-hmm. Frankenstein. And then, you know, it, it is obviously like spoofed in movies like Rocky Horror Picture Show. And it's sure it is a thing that is classic, right? This idea of, of, you know, grotesquery through science and, and, and surgery and medicine. Um, but it is adapted to a very sort of specific subversion of that trope, which is the calculating, meticulous, clean doctor. Um, right. Which is what it, the human centipede is. Like the plot of that movie is he drugs mm. these people, but he puts them through a ver- an otherwise very, very clear medical procedure. He explains very clearly what's happening. He like <laughs> makes sure they're co- they're comfortable in their parts of the procedure. Like it's almost like that and that's what I think makes that movie so much more disconcerting because the movie itself, once you know the concept, I'm talking about the human centipede now. Sure, um, sure, sure, sure. Once you know the concept, it's you know, seeing the movie doesn't add anything more gross because they don't show like a whole lot of gore if that makes sense. It's just, right, yeah. you know, it's, it's just the concept that's gross. Right. So this doctor, I think there's something about this movie that tries to do a little bit of everything. Um, which is probably the only criticism that I would have for this film is that I do not understand, uh, this doctor's character, which, Interesting. Uh, what is his name? <clears throat> G- Genesee mm-hmm. or yeah. G- 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 Genesee. Yeah. Whatever. Um, okay. Yeah. He, so yes, you're right. There's two things at odds. Like he has guilt. He did this thing. He's trying to help his daughter. And, you know, it theoretically comes from a place of love. But the movie starts with him talking about, um, you know, talking about a very, very sort of medical jargon things, right? This is, you, you, you mentioned this. The movie literally opens with him giving a lecture, you know, right, right. Or a seminar on uh, phys- uh, physical rejuvenation. Yeah, yeah. Basically, like skin, skin drafting, skin grafts, skin grafting. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, he keeps a cellar full of hounds that you don't realize <laughs> until like three quarters, even yeah. later. Three, three, yeah, at least, at least, right, right. That he's. I thought he was using them to like dispose of bodies or something. That was oh, my assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, he uses them to like experiment on and, and check. And so, you know, I guess right. a case could be made that he started this process 
to save his daughter. But it, that doesn't seem right. It seems like this has been something that he's been doing for a long time. So he's kind of the human centipede doctor character. Interesting who then right, f- right. stumbles into this sad moment where he needs to use his medical yeah. obsession to save his daughter's face. So that's interesting. Have you, are you, do you know the, uh, Aronofsky movie, the fountain? I do. I have not actually seen that. It's on my list, but, well, I, I actually love that movie. That movie is derided, I think unfairly, but, but uh, I mean, then this is no, this is no real spoiler. It, it, you know, it right off the bat, but Hugh Jackman, one of the two leads is essentially a cancer scientist. You know, he researches cancer and mm-hmm. aging and his wife, and he's always, that's his job and he does that. And then his wife, Rachel Weiss, my, one of my favorite actresses of all time is diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. And so his job is super germane, you know, like his job is totally relevant all of a sudden for, for the movie purposes, which is like, Wow, how convenient that your mm-hmm. you know your wife has cancer and and is you know and you can and you're on the quest for immortality and and you know on the quest to cure aging and that sort of thing or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So it, it, I guess I, I mean it's it's just what your your point, which I think is a really interesting one about his motivations. It's like I guess it's, I guess it's a little too neat for you, is what it sounds like, right? Like that he that he's like. His daughter needs a new face, but it just so happens that he's a face doctor, <laughs> you know? That well, And that's what I mean. And it's like, it's also, he is, you know, they, they seem to want you to come away from this film both feeling bad for the doctor, but also feeling like he's a despicable, depraved human being. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the only true clean villain of this movie is his assistant, who you know, is theoretically, who's a real villain. Yeah. You know, ostensibly in love with him or is pay repaying her debt for receiving her own face. I don't know. Um, yeah, we don't, we're not sure. Right. Yeah. And so I think that, that, I don't know if I'm looking for a different answer. And like I said, it's a very thin criticism because I think the movie is very effective. You understand all of his motivations. And I think Mm -hmm. they tried to give him too many motivations. I think, I think he's almost, I I see what you mean. It's not character complexity. It's almost like they didn't want to choose. Um, so right, I get you. So, it, it, yeah, it's interesting because I think probably what this movie's trying to say is, you know, something about vanity and something about, you know, vanity always rots you from underneath, no matter how many times you mm-hmm. try to cover it up. I mm-hmm. don't know. Like, there's there's something yeah, there, sure. and I think that that's possibly why this this sort of daughter loving father trope came into play. But no, I mean, yeah, I, I actually I'd like to close out with you can you share any of the information that you you said you had read some stuff about the censorship and uh i'd love to hear more about that because i didn't i didn't do any of that reading um i am by no means an expert on it um i just know that um it was it was a it was a struggle to get this film made in france in 1960 the way that Franju wanted it to be made, it was based on a it was based on a novel, I believe, and I and I know from my reading that some of the studio executives or whoever were saying, okay, we can't have we can't have uh, gore in it because of X. We can't have. I remember one of the things that people objected to, I think, because of the German release, believe it or not, was we can't have a mad scientist trope. I guess the Germans were. Um, a bit sensitive to that, probably because of Dr. Mengele is my guess, but mm. who knows? Um, and and, there, and then there were other things, you know, like there were there were a whole number of things that they, they couldn't have in the film, or that or that there was pressure about um, about about cutting um, because of fear of you know scandalizing people or whatever. Um, so I know that a lot of changes had to be done, had to be made um, to satisfy a lot of different voices. Um, and I also know I don't, but I but it'd be interesting. I don't know specifically, but I, I do know that when the movie came to America, it came in a pretty significantly altered way. Um, I mean, it was dubbed, which I, I imagine was true for a lot of of quote unquote foreign pictures when they came over to the states. Sure. But um, I don't know. It'd be really interesting to to get a sense of how this movie, and I, and I don't know that requires some some outside research and, and how this movie was changed. Um, based on the sort of Protestant sensibilities of of the world, I guess in 1960. Yeah, you want to see his kind of unfiltered vision. Totally, and and I think that's what we saw. I mean, I, I think what we saw. In fact, I'm pretty sure that what we saw was 
was the movie that was made. Although I do know, oh, that's right. I wanted to bring this up at the very beginning of, of, of the episode because you said, uh, you said something that made me think of it and it slipped my mind, but that the American release was not called Eyes Without a Face, but was called The Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus, which is tremendous. It's like what? such a pulpy B-movie title. Yeah, The Horror Chamber of Dr. Faustus. Really? It's so funny. There's no Dr. Faustus in this movie. I mean, I get, you know, Faust Faust and the, the sort of, the you know, bargaining with the devil kind of thing. But but it's so funny, yeah. Yeah, that's that sort is, of weird that, is, that they chose to, like, like cheekily rename the doctor in the title. Um, and, like, I'm sorry, but this is not, it was not a horror chamber. It, it was, it was, in some ways, there's a kind of wholesome quality to it because it was all for the daughter's sake, you know? It was not, it was not the, the, like, I... People refer to this film, both when it came out and still, you know, as as a shock horror, uh, as as a kind of like a, you know, it, it belongs in the shock horror subgenre, um, and I can see that. But I it is but it is I mean to your point earlier it is just it's tough to bridge the gap of sixty years and be and be genuinely shocked. By what I was, what I was seeing. Yeah, a lot of fucked up shit has happened in the world. Oh my god! Conceptually, yeah, it's so disturbing what's going yeah. on in this movie. But the visuals are dated, um, and honestly, it makes me want to see a film. It makes me, it makes me kind of yearn for a, a sort of non-existent, or at least to my knowledge, horror movie whose scares come entirely in dialogue. You know, mm. uh, almost, almost as if you're reading a story, or someone's reading a story to you. You know, where, right. where the concepts are the scariest thing. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of movies that kind of flirt with that notion just using music, like Mulholland Drive, which we've brought up in yes, this podcast yeah, 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 before. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well the, the, I, I, like, dialogue I, yeah. scares is sort of like a, a Lynch thing to do, to do, no? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I think this film is... Um, I, I I don't I, and I guess my point with it is some of the visuals are dated some of the like way of talking is dated um which is weird to say because it's in French uh and maybe that was why <laughs> like you didn't get that uh listen here you see like kind of <laughs> kind of voice that has become sort of a caricature of itself because it's right, in a different right, language right. maybe the French version of that was there and I just don't know because I don't speak French but sure I suppose that's true, but I guess my point being is is the visuals are, are dated in some places, but some places they're really not like that. They're really that. Well, the DP, I mean, just let's just like just to put his name on the record, just to say you. I don't. I mean, I can't say you've got a Polish name. I don't. Eugen Shoften, <laughs> Jewish Polish DP who invented. By the way, I don't know if you looked into this, but the Shoften process, which was this incredible use of mirrors to project actors into miniatures used most notably in metropolis by fritz lang really? um, but this dp who, who there's very little about him on you know on the internet which i thought was a shame uh w- was so good in this movie every shot was breathtaking to me every shot was perfect yeah yeah i mean it, it, honestly like because of what was in vogue at the time of framing people, mm-hmm. I think that is what dated it for me because of how they frame people. You know, they, they don't, they, they do a lot of really wide shots of like, you see people like with their feet touching the ground, but then you see waist up shots and they're just like, it's just approaches that a lot of filmmakers don't right. choose anymore. Um, Some German expressionism kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, that felt that's I think that's where the the Andy Griffith Dick Van Dyke kind of nonsense <laughs> for right. me for me just because that's what it was but yeah the, yeah of course but then the non human shots you know the shots that were like of 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 you know the establishing house shots and some of the shots of entering rooms were just incredible and and the the scale Amazing. the scale of this sort of Versailles esque house could have been so you know handled so differently but it almost felt claustrophobic in places um Mm -hmm. and that's strictly because of the way they chose to shoot the film so right um yeah i I thought it was great um and yeah i think i think that brings us to should we rate it yeah what do you think all righty 
Let's do it. Let us rate them. All right. So, so our first rating here, folks, is uh, is our, our rating of, of general fear factor. Um, we like to rate out of uh, zero to five sheep, with five being the scariest because you had to count more sheep in order to fall asleep. Um, mm-hmm. What do you rate this film on at a zero to five sheep, Zach? Um. Okay. Uh, I think I give it. I give it two sheep. Or maybe, no, I'll give it two and a half sheep, not because I actually had trouble falling asleep, but because I found it sort of viscerally, imagistically scary. But I can see the film in my mind's eye so clearly, certain shots of the film so clearly, a full 24 hours plus since I watched it, or 24 hours since I watched it. And that's unusual for me. Um, it, 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 It really looked... Like, it really kind of seared my mind a little bit. Um, Yeah. So I want to give it something a little bit beefy. Two and a half is kind of high for me. And now that I'm a sort of a jaded old timer, thanks to you, frankly. (laughs) So, (laughs) uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I land on. How about you? Um, Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's a two point five for sure. Um, Mm. I wonder if it was seared into your brain because of the uh, because of the ridiculous (laughs) <laughs> the ridiculously high level of contrast involved. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think it is very scary. I think the surgery scene alone is, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I exclaimed out loud, um, during yeah. that scene. I think the dog attack scene, which we didn't really call, talk, oh call out at the end, but I thought I was super impressed with that scene considering like, um, you know, how, how many dogs were involved. Like, I, I know this was kind of before yeah. the era of like, no dogs were hurt in the, in the filming of this film, but like, <laughs> so, <laughs> right, uh, right, who right, knows right. what sort of like sadistic things they had to do to get these dogs to do what they wanted them to do. But, um, I thought that was an incredibly, incredibly disturbing scene. Um, and then mm-hmm. just, 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 uh, just this woman's performance with a mask, you know, I think, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, just the emotion she got and the and the and the scariness she got out of it was was incredible. Right. Um, right. Great. And so our uh, second and final rating is the rating of quality, and we we do this one at a zero to five stars, with uh, five being a masterpiece and zero being a complete dumpster fire. Um, <laughs> Zach, what do you? Uh, what do you what, what are you gonna rate this Criterion Collection classic? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I, I I was anticipating feeling like a moron, like at this yeah. at this part of yeah. the episode. I I mean, listen, I I absolutely love this movie. I, I it's a four and a half star for me. Um, wow! But you're right. It's like, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, maybe one maybe one episode we'll get into like what the hell our ratings even mean. To us, you know, how yeah. we arrive at them and what what they mean. and uh, But my, my rating is a four and a half. And frankly, I don't really care about justifying that. I thought it was amazing. Um, it's not my favorite movie in the world, which is maybe why I took off half a star. I don't know. What can I say? <laughs> I gave it four and a half stars. It's a pretty good rating. Yeah. Well, I think it's a rating of, of preference, right? You know, it's like every... Yeah. yeah, even even Citizen Kane, you're going to bring your only your, your preferences into it, and right, and, right, and and so I, I think that's fair, and and no genre is 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 a greater victim to that than mm. a horror film because it's so it relates so much to what scares you, what you know impacts you, what you find profound, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think this film is like you said, it's a great film. I'm going to give it a four because okay. I like to rate my films on how I feel while I'm watching them. And it, it, this movie had to win me over. It had a handicap of sure. This is going to be old hoagie nonsense. Like it had its handicap. And the, like I already told you, I was very impressed that it overcame that and really scared me. It had some moments. I think there were, t- there were some threads left on, un- unthreaded i guess um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i don't know why maybe maybe further reading will help me um but yeah i think i think this is a four four star movie for me um and i think just so you know this is a meta score metacritic score of 90 so you are on par (laughs) by the way (laughs) (laughs) wonderful wonderful (laughs) Uh, well 
I think Tremendous. That, that brings us to the end. Uh, Zach, did you have any more uh, any more things you wanted to say about our dear French film here? I just wanted to say, Jay, that I love you very dearly, and you're a very, oh. you're a very close friend of mine, and I enjoy these podcasts with you. Oh, Zach. Well, I love you too. Hopefully, hopefully, as much as our listeners love listening. Um, oh God, they don't. It's not possible. <laughs> But if you love us to any degree, please uh, check us out <laughs> on the internet at fearandthere.com. That's A-N-D, not ampersand. Um, you can also hit us up at Twitter and Instagram and Facebook by, with the same username. Um, and you can email us. You can also just hit us. If you see us on yeah. the street, you could just punch us. You could just assault, assault us. Yeah, punch us and then say fear in there. Um, yeah, and, and, <laughs> and if you head to fear in there, you can uh, – we have some merch, I guess. It's a good thing to – point out sure do um, we sure do yeah our uh our gracious uh overlords at the public house media mothership uh have <laughs> i think i'm twisting my <laughs> metaphors there uh <laughs> have, have set up a little merch store for us so if you are a fan and want a t-shirt or i don't know a koozie or apparently there are throw pillows there so that's fun um so just get the pillow yeah if you Literally, want that's the only thing yeah <laughs> if you want uh if you're in their merch uh you know you can buy it there. That supports us. Um, and yeah, I think what's most important is to rate us on and, and subscribe to us on, on wherever you listen to your podcasts, whether it's, you know, Stitcher or Apple podcasts or Spotify, just hit that follow button or give us a five star rating. Cause it really helps us, uh, helps new people discover the podcast. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh that's it. That wraps it up. This is uh episode eighteen of that's Fear in There. The whole kit and caboodle. The kit and the caboodle. Um Beautiful. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you, most importantly, to Zach for sitting here and uh, listening to me bash uh, a simpler time in, in <laughs> cinema history. <laughs> well, <all right. laughs> you're welcome, Jay. Anytime. All right, man. Um, all right, folks. Well, I'll talk to you. Uh, I'll talk to you next time. Talk to you next time. All right, bye, guys.